I'm so grateful to be here uh, with you today. My name is Matt Lightfoot. Um, I had the opportunity a little bit earlier in the week to uh, spend some time with you on, on Monday, actually, uh, for the prayer and communion service. So it's good to see you, Michael. Uh, and your wife, forgive me, was it Cindy? Yeah. Awesome. Um, got to see Guy and Carl, and, uh, and Michael's been helping me out all week. Uh, just make sure that, that we're ready for, here, for you here this Sunday. And um, I'm just super glad to be here with you and just, just thank you for the opportunity to uh, share in worship with the Lord here today. So um, so this is 2020, isn't it? Is it still 2020? Yeah. Anyone want to hurry it up? Yeah. <laughs> it's been an interesting year, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what, um, despite whatever 2020 has been uh, for all of us, it's certainly been... Uh, a, an interesting thing for our family, but um, whatever it has been, we're now in the Christmas season, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. And in the Christmas season, we get the opportunity to uh, just celebrate uh, some, maybe some holiday traditions, time with family, uh, but most importantly, we get to sh celebrate the fact that our Lord came to be amongst us. Amen. Amen. Right? And so uh, I thought, what more fitting than to... Uh, and to go and dig into what that is, what John says about it. Um, so if you'll open uh, your Bibles with me, we're going to be in John chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from, uh, uh, actually be reading from the NIV. I, I think some of the few Bibles are, or the ones on your tables are, are the NLT, so it's just a slight difference, but um, shouldn't be too much of a problem for you. John chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 1 through 18 to start. Um, but I just got to be honest with you. As I was uh, spending time with the Lord this week, and he had me all over the place. Um, John 1 is absolutely the heart of this message. Um, and we're, we're going to spend most of our time there. But just bear with me if I, um, if I start pulling in stuff from the New Testament, from the Old Testament. I've got stuff from the Gospels. I've got stuff from Paul. I've got stuff from Psalms. I got stuff when I came in here on Monday, and I happened to see some of the things written uh, on the doorposts and here on the floors. I'll tell you what. The word's all around us. Amen. So um, I, I just want to tell you how blessed you are um, to have uh, Pastor Moses um, as, a, as a pastor. I understand he's transitioning out, um, and, uh, and you have some elders who are, who are walking through that process for, um, uh, to search for a new pastor, whomever God might bring with you. Um, and I just, first and foremost, God is faithful. God is absolutely faithful, and he's going to bring exactly the right person to come and, and carry you into the next phase of whatever his plan for your church is. Amen. And, um, and I'm just, I'm so thrilled just to be here with you today and, and to be able to share this, uh, this time with you. Listen, Pastor Moses loves you guys. As I got to talk with him a little bit, man, just his heart, uh, obviously for the word, you guys know that. He, he has a fierce um, appreciation for the word. Amen. Thank God for that. Um, but man, he loves you guys. He loves you to death. Um, I can tell it when I talk to him. Um, he's, he's a real shepherd. So I just wanted to uh, honor him as well. So let me ask you something. It's Christmas time. Everybody knows, uh, especially the kids know, when you, when you gather around the Christmas tree, what do you find at the bottom of it come Presents. Christmas Day? Presents. Presents, right? Gifts. Gifts. Let me ask you that. You guys have been pretty interactive from what I saw in the previous sermon, so, and you have been already, so, so let's go ahead and keep some of that up. What is the best gift that you have ever given or received? My wife. My wife. Good man. <laughs> yes, sir. And by the way, keep that up because those are, those are brownie points that are building up, and you're, you're going to need those later in life, I promise. All right. Yes, sir. I got to say the wife, though, because... I know, right? All right. Hey, hey guys, if, if you were thankful for your wife, would you just raise your hand? Yeah. Best gift ever? Amen. All right. Good. We got it. What else? Yes, sir. When I was a kid, a plastic four-valve trumpet. A plastic four-valve trumpet? Yeah. Okay. Really? Yeah. How did, did your parents feel like it was the best gift? I don't. Well, they knew I wanted it. I don't mind though. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> awesome. 
So that took a little bit of work probably to practice and make it sound good and, you know. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? That's awesome. Hey, make a joyful noise to the Lord, right? Amen. All right. What about the worst gift? Is, what's the worst gift you've ever given or received? Given or received. And if the person who gave it to you is sitting in this room, just keep your hand up. <laughs> Carl, what is it? One of those happy days for Christmas things I got it at one of our Uh-huh. Yeah, You're running out of time is what that is telling you every time you look at it, right? That was ugly, right? Like, hey, that's awesome. Yeah. My that's parents good. gave me a pillow. A pillow? I mean, that, that's a good present. I mean, if it was a used pillow, maybe not so much. <laughs> awesome. What about, uh, if you guys ever returned a gift, like you've gotten it, and you're, you're like, oh man, this is great, thank you. <laughs> but then you drive back to the store to return it. <laughs> yeah? Done that a couple of times, right? Yeah. But of course, we got to be appreciative. Right? So we are. Um, how many of you have had a gift that has some assembly required? Maybe it takes a little bit of work. Yeah, right? I see a lot of the same men's hand who are thankful for their wives, by the way. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely, right? So let me tell you this story. My parents, um, gosh, what was it? About four or five years ago, um, they thought it would be a, uh, an incredible gift to give my daughter a dollhouse, <laughs> all right? And it was, it was incredible, right? And, and Emma, how much you, did you enjoy it? You loved it, right? It's really cool. And it was one of those things, so my parents got it to us um, the night before, or, or a couple of days before, and, and of course I waited till, till Christmas Eve to put it together. Um, it's about 11.30 at that point at night. And um, so I'm just opening the box for the first time. Mm. I open up the instructions, and I realize everything is in very, very small pieces, mm. yeah. right? And of course, the thing's made in China, so you know it's you know, it's hard to understand the instructions a little bit. And I'm not the most mechanically gifted person. Um, so anyway, I start at this thing. An hour into it, I'm still going. I think I've got like one section, maybe one floor. Um, and by the way, this was one floor two floors, three floors, and like a little penthouse thing. I mean, it's like this tall. So I'm building this thing, and it's three and a half hours or so that go by, and, and I'm exhausted. And of course, we gotta get up early because Santa's coming, right? And we wanna be ready for him. So, uh, so anyway, we go through this whole example, and there was lots of assembly required, lots of extra work that went into that gift. But to see the joy on my daughter's face as she, she played with it um, was, was really something else. You know, we, uh, as, we, as we talk about the scripture today, and we're going to get into John 1, um, what I want to share with you is about the greatest gift that has ever been given. And, and I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag. His name is Jesus. Amen. Okay? He is the Son of God. And, well, I'm going to start preaching right now, so let me, let me pray before I get started. We'll get into the text, and then we'll, we'll get into this, okay? All right, so let's pray. Father, I just thank you. Your word says that nobody comes to you unless you draw them. Here we are, Lord. We're in your house. So that means you must have wanted us to be here. So God, I thank you that you've given us your word, that you've opened it up to us, Lord, that we have the ability to read it. God, we ask your Holy Spirit to come and to make this book alive. Speak to us now, Lord. Get me out of the way. It doesn't matter what I say here today. All that matters is what you say. God, we thank you. We love you. I pray that you would touch every heart here in this room and every heart that's listening online. We thank you for all this. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read all the way through 18, and then I'm going to come back um, to the first probably three verses, and we'll kind of chunk it up a little bit. Would that be okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and read uh, the first, beginning with the first verse through verse 18. In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made that were made. Without Him, nothing, has, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And some other translations say the darkness cannot overcome it. There came a man who was sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men, all people, might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own wouldn't receive him. But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him, and he cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Amen. This is the word, of the, the word of God for the people of God. So I want to jump back for a moment to the first couple of verses. What are the first three words that you see in this text? That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, Genesis 1, right? Yeah, Genesis 1. So John brings us this story about Jesus, the word of God. And he brings us all the way back to the beginning. In my Bible, that's over 1,000 pages. Probably yours too. Over 1,200 even. It brings us all the way back to page 1. Well, what does it say in page 1? Well, let's take a look. Let's go to uh, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. You see, God had started creating the world. He created everything in it. He created uh, the heavens and the earth. He created the waters uh, and separated the waters from the sky. And then he created all of the living things. He created the land before the living things. Um, but he created all of this stuff, um, the, the animals in, in the water, uh, the, the birds in the air, every living creature, all of the plants and vegetation. And then on the sixth day, it says this in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Hang on. Let us make man in our own image. Now, we're talking about the Trinity here. This is the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make God in our image. Okay, so man is going to be like us. And by the way, when I say man here, I'm speaking mankind, right? I'm saying, I'm saying people. Let us make man in our own image. In our own likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So, God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so what we get is this picture where God is creating and gives purpose to mankind. Right? He tells them to go and rule over everything that I've created. And then when he finishes, if you get down to verse uh, 31, he says, God saw everything that he made, and it was very good. If you go back a little bit and read everything else, the account of everything else he had created, it wasn't very good. It was just good. It was good. Amen. Which for God, that's, I mean, it's incredible for us. Right? But when God made man, it was very good. It's very good. It doesn't take long before the story changes. Right? But before there, we get one more picture of creation. It's in Genesis 2 7. By the way, the reason why I went there is because we find that Jesus himself, John, has told us um, that the Word was with God in the beginning. He was part of the Trinity that was part of the creation. He was there from the very beginning. It wasn't just some idea that God had, hey, let me just spring up a man who's just like me. No, this was part of the plan from the very beginning. Amen. From the very beginning. So by the way, when you get 1,200 pages into this book and you realize how much we mess up mm. and how much every single person trying to follow God had failed, it was part of the plan. Can I say that? Yeah. Yeah. Human failure was part of the plan. Because God is bigger than human failure. Amen. Can I tell you that no matter what you're experiencing today, no matter what you're failing in today, some of us, we look at our failures and that's just, we're blinded by it. That's the only thing that we can see. We can see how we didn't fall short, or how we, how we fall short every time, how we, how we didn't come through the way we were supposed to, the way we needed to, the way we wanted to, the way God would expect us to. And we have the law, a testament to what holiness looks like. We have the life of Christ, the perfect sinless Lamb of God, and we know what His life was like because of the Gospels. And we can't always reach that standard, can we? I was talking to Michael earlier, and, and just, just one little thing he brought up, right? In, in 1 Peter, he says, be holy as I am holy. How do you do it? How do you do it? There's one way. It's with him. It's Amen. through him. Amen. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But Genesis 2-7 says this. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Here's another thing that we get tying back to the beginning, right? Let me, let me go back to John 1. What did it say again? It said, what came into being through the word was what? Life. And the life was the light for all people. So in Genesis 1, God creates man. Genesis 2, he breathes his life into him and he comes alive. He has purpose already because God gave it to him. And then uh, he puts him in the Garden of Eden, Eden because that's, that's where God wanted him. He had work to do to till the ground and, and, and uh, rule over all the creation that was there. And then we learn in Genesis 3, there's another character. And that character comes in the form of a serpent and tempts first Eve and then tempts Adam and they both eat from the tree, right? The tree that they were told not to eat from. And man, can I just tell you that in this country, in our church culture, Genesis 3 might be one of the biggest points of doctrine that we preach in all of the gospel. Right? The fact of the fallibility of man, the fact that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah. Every single one of us. Not one of us righteous. No. Not me, certainly not. No. Not any of us. And yet, 
It was all part of the plan. From the beginning. In the beginning. Forgive me as I work my notes here a little bit. Let's go back to the text in John. Back to John 1, I'm sorry. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. What do we know about Jesus' life? Anyone, feel free. What do we know about Jesus' life? How did it start? Started it in a manger. He was the son of a carpenter, right? Joseph. Um, was there anything miraculous or spectacular about his birth? Absolutely. He was born of a virgin, right? Which was foretold in the Old Testament, right? Yes, sir. Angels brought the real news on Sunday. <laughs> That's right. Angels brought the real news, right? Can you imagine if you were one of those shepherds at night? You're just, you got your stick and you're, you're going like this, moving your sheep around, right? Tending your flocks at night. And then all of a sudden, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, that's, that's, an, that's an army of angels, all of a sudden shows up and begins to proclaim how incredible the news is that Jesus has been born, that a light has come into the world. Incredible, right? I mean, we know the story. I, I, could have, I could have gone and preached Luke 2, right? And just tell you everything about how the birth happened. And I could have drawn it back to prophecy and all of that. But I didn't think that's what God wanted to do. We know this story. It's not about a baby. Right? The gospel is not about a baby. Because that baby grew up. That baby lived his life. And before I get too far, that baby was meant to die. Amen. And not just any death. Right? A pretty incredible death. Um... Really not wanting to get ahead of myself. <laughs> um, the light that came into the world was the life. I'm sorry. The light that came into the world was the light of all mankind. What is it about light? You have this this motif about light and darkness. What is it about the light that is so incredible? What happens if if we shut off all the lights and someone had a flashlight? What would happen? Yeah, depending on how bright it was, the whole room might bright up, right? With, what would happen to the darkness? It's gone. Yeah, it's gone. We turn on these lights, there is not a window in here, right? I don't see any darkness. Nice stadium lights. Yeah, can you imagine? And so we get this motif of light and dark, right? John is saying light came into the world, and darkness has not overcome it, cannot overcome it, right? Jesus talked a little bit more about that in Matthew when he was talking about um, letting our uh, – he talked about you are the light of the world, um, a city on a hill. And he said you don't, put, you don't put light under a basket. No, no, no. You take the basket off so that all of the room can be filled with that light, right? In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works Amen. and praise who? Jesus. Your Father who's in heaven, right? right. Yeah. This, this, this theme of light is incredible. Let me go back to the text here one more time. The thing is, light can be seen, right? We can see it with our eyes. It's plain. You don't have to like have like the right words. You know, can you imagine trying to describe light to a bright person or to a blind person? That might be hard, right? But we don't have to. We don't have to because because light can be seen. So if it can be seen, then obviously there's got to be some kind of testimony to the fact that this light that John was talking about came into the world, and John gives us that. He not only gives us those first five verses that talk about what was happening, but he also says there was a man from John sent from God, and he came as a witness to testify concerning the light. You see, John was kind of this weird guy. He was, he was dressed in camel hair. All he ate were locusts. Those are bugs. And honey, right? Um, how well do you think that guy would have been accepted in 
in first century Jerusalem. Who is this guy? Right? Yeah, so, but, but Isaiah says that his task was to come and prepare the way for the Lord. The Spirit of God was on him. And so he went out and he was baptizing people. People would come out to him. Word about him got out about this, this holy man who was out in the wilderness. And so people would go out from the cities into the wilderness. And they would go and they would, they would be baptized by him. They would, they, would have, they would want their sins to be washed away. Because everybody knows that our sin is hard to deal with. Right? right. And we don't want it. Sometimes we might do things because it just seems like the right thing to do, or maybe we want it in the moment, but, but it has no lasting fruit. Anyone who comes to these poison wells finds that they're still thirsty at the end of it, yeah. right? And so all of a sudden, these people were going out into the wilderness. What would it take for us to, to leave our comfort zone and go into the wilderness to go find the Lord? Because it wasn't about John. It was what the Lord was doing in him, through him, and with him. John was doing his purpose to prepare the way. And so he began to baptize. He began to baptize people um, uh, in, a, in a baptism of repentance. Giving them this, this outward symbol of a washing away of their sin. Right? That the water would wash them clean. And that they would have uh, this moment that they remembered to be able to walk out in faith. Um, the fact that, that their sin had been washed. But then if they sinned again, it had to be washed again. If you sinned again, you had to wash again. And oh, by the way, before Jesus, you had to go and uh, make sacrifices, uh, blood sacrifices of animals and, and all of these things that were just, that seemed totally foreign in our context today, right? So people began to wonder, Man, that guy's from God. Something's, something's going on with him. Could he be the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? But John speaks plainly. Actually, we didn't read this part. This is in verse 19 and beyond. He says, I am not the Messiah. There is coming one after me whose shoes I'm not uh, worthy to untie. And he was pointing the way to Jesus. In the same way, you and I have that same opportunity that when we've come and we've had an opportunity um, to meet the risen king, when we've had the opportunity to meet Jesus, when we've had an encounter with him, when his spirit has come and filled us, we have this opportunity to go and tell people what he's like. And by the way, did you know that you can tell people what he's like without even using your mouth, Amen. without even your words? There is a love that can come through us, that can work in us and through us towards others that will all of a sudden help people realize, wait a minute, something's different. That's, that's not how people normally act. Why, why are they being so kind to me? Why would they do that? I mean, yeah, maybe I'm experiencing some bad time and there's some difficulty. Maybe we're wondering about what's going on in a pandemic, and yet we gather. We do it safely and smartly. We, we, you know, we try to do the distancing thing and all of that stuff, but, but we still gather because human interaction is important, Amen. especially human interaction that has the spirit of God working through it. Amen. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. Jesus came in a miraculous way, in a miraculous way, but then he disappeared for about 30 years. He was in obscurity. Nobody knew about him. This, this road that he walked, if you remember, when he was born, he, he ended up going out to basically be a refugee in Egypt. Do you remember how that happened? Herod had ordered the, the murder of everyone, every male under two years old. And so his family had to leave. Joseph being warned in a dream, he fled to Egypt. And then eventually they would come back, right? Settle in Nazareth before all of a sudden a census is called and they have to go. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, forgive me. I got that backwards. <laughs> um, but anyway, he, he was essentially a refugee for a time, right? His entire life was not comfortable. He went into obscurity. He started learning, right? You know, sometimes we... 
the Lord comes to us and sometimes he put it, puts us on a platform or, or in front of people and all of a sudden, you know, the spirit working through us, we can, we can just go and give, but, but we have to come back into obscurity, right? Matthew 6 talks about um, how we ought to pray. Do you guys remember that? He says, don't do it like the hypocrites do. Don't go out and stand in the synagogues and just so that way you can be heard and seen. He says, no. He says, go into your room. Close the door. Pray to your father who is in secret. And what will happen? Your father who sees in secret will reward you. Will reward you. And I'm just, I'm talking about a lot of different things here right now. But, but when, we, when we look at the life of Christ, we see a different way. We see a different way. There's a way to do this where it's not about looking at everyone else. It's not even about looking at ourselves. It's about looking at him. It's looking at him. Because by the way, he lived that life, came, and died. Not only did he die, he was murdered. He was set up. He was born to die. Well, how, God, how could God do that? That was his son. That was his son. How is he going to put him on a cross? Well, the, the cross is a symbol of suffering. I mean, the Catholics still, still show him on the cross with the, but the crucifix, right? They say that the, the, the way that he died was that, that he agonized and suffered. And eventually he suffocated under the weight of his own body. Not to mention, oh, by the way, that, uh, that he had, uh, you know, all of the beatings and the, and the, the 40 lashes and, and all of these things that, I mean, how could he even endure the cross, let alone the road to it? How about the shame that was even before that? The fact that here's this young Jewish boy or Jewish man who, who had learned in, uh, about the scriptures. And now all of a sudden he goes and starts to share, but everybody hates what he's saying. Anyone been there? You go and you look at the word and you're like, man, this is what it is. God showed me this. So I don't know how this makes sense, but it does. I can see the truth of it. Man, let me tell you about this. Don't, don't give me that Jesus. Don't talk to me about him. You're kidding me. There's, there's something about Jesus that he chose to endure the suffering. Not only to endure it, but to walk it out. To do it in perfect love. In perfect love. The light was in the world. And the world came into being through the light. But the world did not recognize that light. If they persecuted Jesus... What's that say for us? It's going to happen. Should we be afraid? No. Why? He's got it. It's part of the plan from the beginning. Is it hard? You better believe sometimes. <laughs> but he told us how to pray. He told us how to get through it. Did he tell us that we ought to start forming factions and we ought to prepare and, and store up food and and, you know, take a stand against our government? No. Is that stuff out there? You better yeah. believe it. Anyone on Facebook? <laughs> Man, if you believe Facebook for the last nine, ten months, I'll tell you what. I, I think we're on borrowed time. But God is patient. He's not willing that anyone would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's in Second Peter. He's with us. He's our Emmanuel, God with us. He's given us the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. Amen. It's John 14. Amen. Right after John 14, it's an incredible chapter. John 15 talks about abiding with him, spending time with him. He says, if you don't abide in me, you can have no part of me. Mm. It's going to cut off the branch. You're going to lose your life supply if, you, if you're not with him. He's with us. But we, we can choose not to be with him. <coughs> but 
but God is full of grace. He is full of grace, full of love. Not counting our sins against us, but taking care of those on the cross. Constantly inviting us to be with him, to know him. You want to talk about the greatest gift that's ever been given. What's the first verse that comes to mind? The, the one that every Christian knows. John 3.16. Yeah, it's John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but has eternal life. What's eternal life mean? Forever. Forever, right. What did Jesus say eternal life meant? I'm not trying to stump you. You have to go to John 17. John 17, 3, in fact. Jesus is praying to the Father before he begins to walk to the cross. John 17, 3 says this. And this is eternal life. That you may know the one true God. And the one he sent. Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. Wait, maybe I got that wrong. And this is eternal life, that you may know about God. No, no, that's not it. That you may know who God is. No, that's not it. You catch it? That you may know God. That you yourself may have a personal relationship with him. That when you go into your room and close the door and you pray that the God of heaven and earth, the one who created this world from the very beginning in all of his glory, that he alone will be with you. Amen. And you and you. Isn't that the true Lord's prayer? He's there. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it be? Did you know that Jesus prayed for us? Yes. In John 17? Oh, my gosh. Do I want to turn there? Yeah, I'm going to turn there. John 17, I want to say, is it 6? Yeah. He says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. By the way, that's not even possible if Jesus isn't with you. Right? If, if he's not with us, we have no hope. There's no way we can obey him. And yet... Um, and yet, uh, Jesus says that if we love him, we will obey his commandments. Well, how, God, you're, you're going to tell me to do something that I can't do. So how am I going to do it? Just love me. If you love me, if, if, if the reason why you're here is because you love Jesus and you want to know more about him, if you want to grow into him, if that's why you're here, you can't possibly not obey his commandments or at least want to. And then you take it to prayer. God, I, I screwed up. How do I do this? Well, that's easy. Believe in me. Trust in me. Don't rely on yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Do it the way I do it. Let me get back into this. I'm sorry. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. This is Jesus speaking to the Father. For I gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you. And they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. Jesus praying, praying for his disciples. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All that I have is yours and all that you have is mine. Man, wouldn't that be incredible if that was our heart cry? Everything that we have, complete surrender. God, that it's yours and everything that you have then becomes mine as a son as a daughter. Amen. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. We don't look like one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name that you gave me. And so far this whole time, he's, he's only speaking about the disciples, right? 
Go down to verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And then through their message. And then through their message. And through their message. And then through their message. And by the way, it's the same message all the way that found each and every one of us at some point in our life. It's the same message. It's about Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I could have come here and I could have told you about, you know, all this theological stuff that I looked up and how great it was. And, and man, oh, if you, if, you, if you look at the Greek in this way, it kind of gets this. And that kind of means this other thing. And I could have come with all sorts of knowledge and I could have given it to you like, you have been like, man, this guy's really smart. Don't know what he said. Doesn't mean anything to me. God impressed on my heart a couple of months ago. In 1 Corinthians 2, he said, For I have resolved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all it is. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. I should probably begin to wrap up here. I'm going to head back to, to John 1. But those who did welcome him, who believed in his name, this is verse 12. But those who did welcome him, but those who believed in his name, he authorized or gave the right to become God's children. Children of God. Do you guys remember the story of the prodigal? story of the prodigal son, right? The one who, who um, said, you know what? I'm done with this family. I'm done with it. Give me my money. Give me my inheritance. I'm getting out of here. And he left. How many of us, if we had that in our family, would, would be pretty upset with that kid? Yeah. You better believe it. How many of us have that person in our family? Keep your hands down. <laughs> How many people have been that kid? I have. I was born and raised in California, went off and joined the Navy because I was tired of all of the, the stuff in my house, the, the household that I grew up in. It was nothing about my parents and what they had done. It was just about my own, my own ideas about what life was supposed to be, and so I left. Joined the Navy. And the Navy did a lot of great things for me. But the Lord has been even better because Amen. God has begun to restore those relationships, even though I ran away. Amen. And God has given me this real life example in my own life about how, how he brings reconciliation and forgiveness and healing to people, especially in relationships. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Can I tell you that he offers the same thing to everyone? Amen. It's, it's a part of the truth. It's the truth of his word. Forgiveness is so incredible. For, we, didn't, we didn't come up with forgiveness all by ourselves. It, it was the, the plan of the Father was all about forgiveness and love. It's incredible. Well, how did that forgiveness come to be? Well, look at verse 14. John 1, verse 14. It says, the word became flesh and he made his home among us. He made his home among us. How many of you have heard that the body is the temple of God? Amen. The temple of the Lord. Yeah. yeah. What does that mean? God lives in you. God lives in us. Yeah. Right to the point. That's it. That's it. God lives in us. Do you remember? Why would I spend all that time going through, through Genesis uh, 1? How did God create us? What did he put inside of us? Breath of life. The breath of life. Absolutely. And so that was in John two, or Genesis 2.7. What was before that in Genesis 1? He put his image in us, right? Yeah. Wait, wait. When did we fall? What chapter? Three. Three. Genesis 3. But in Genesis 1, he gave us his image. In Genesis 2, he gave us the breath of life. So which came first? The sin? Did the sin come first? No. No. Why do we focus on it so much? 
Why do we focus on it? We're human. Yeah. And that's okay. God doesn't want us to be anything other than, than who we are. But he's not going to leave us where he found us. Praise God. Right. God is doing something different. We've heard this gospel that starts in Genesis 3 and it ends in Revelation 20. It's the story of sin. It's the story of mankind and how we failed. And because it's most of the book, we, that's what we pay attention to. But if we'll allow ourselves to see it from God's perspective, because every good book starts with a beginning and an end. It starts with Genesis 1. It starts with Genesis 2. God was trying to do something in humanity. But what's he trying to do? Why do I have to go through all this junk in the middle? God created us with purpose and intention for relationship with him. He put his image inside of us. So by the way, no matter how dirty you think you are, there is something worth redeeming inside each and every one of you. Amen. Amen. He put it in there because he was coming for it later. When you would know that it was him. What are we going to do with it? God is making all things new. Read the book of Revelation. Everything he is doing is, he's, he's trying to make all things new. Not to, to, to um, be a part of the, the way the world works and, and the, the, the spirit of the world, that, that's the enemy, right? And what he's doing. But no, God wants us to partner with him. He wants us to give him our lives and let him empower us to do what he did. Oh, hold on, preacher. Do what he did? No. You're not one of those uh, not one of those crazy people, right? No. In fact, one of the things when Moses, uh, I, I sent Moses some, uh, I have two sermons that, that I had recorded in the past, and, and he said, hey, you know what, I, I really need to make sure that you're not going to preach some wacky stuff, so I, I need you to, to send me what you got. Okay, not, not a problem, absolutely. I, you love your people, you're going to protect your people, please do. And so I, I sent him what I had. And the first text I got back, was, uh, hey man, uh, that was pretty cool, but then what was, what was that all about with the handling of snakes? By the way, there was no handling of snakes. That was just him kind of pointing at and making a joke, right? So anyway, that, that totally fell flat. That was supposed to be a joke, but <laughs> <laughs> the, the point being is, man, there's some wacky stuff out there. And can I tell you, if you read the scripture, there's some mystery. God, what do you mean that could we actually do some of the things that you do? Well, sure, maybe we could forgive. Maybe we could heal. Right? Heal relationships. Are you still going to do signs and wonders and miracles around us? Absolutely. Hang on. Ready? You got that bread? It's free. It came by God's grace. That means he's not done with us. God is patient, but he wants us. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to be with him. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Can I tell you something? The, the first time I walked in these doors on Monday, I came in and uh, began to walk into the sanctuary, and I saw something right up on the doorpost. What was it? Yeah, together, let us go up to the mountain of the, war, of the Lord, or ascend the mountain of the Lord, right? It's Psalm 24. I had to look it up. Don't judge me. That's okay. <laughs> the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Mm. I'm disqualified. Mm. Without Jesus, I'm, I'm disqualified. Yeah. I can't. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your faith, O God of Jacob. 
there's someone coming who's going to be able to ascend the mountain of the Lord. And when I say I'm speaking in the future because I'm, I'm speaking from David's point of view. This, this was a psalm of David, right? So this was future to David. Lift up, and then get this. He ends it with this. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. Amen. The Lord, mighty in battle. Amen. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. You know, the thing with light, if you remember... Um, you go back, you just picture Moses wandering in the wilderness. What were they following? Fire and cloud. Yeah, fire and, uh, well, uh, during the day, it was a cloud during the day fire. and a fire at night, right? It's God's glory. They're following this, this cloud of glory. Where? To the place that God will show them, right? Now, that, that language is from Abraham, but, but the point is they were following Abraham and, and waiting Hang on. Moses. I think I just, yeah, forgive me. <laughs> Sorry, Moses. Um, so they're following this glory. Why was it a fire at night? Because they can't see the sun during the night. Yeah, it was light. The light of the world, right? God in the world. They're following God, right? The world has seen a great light, the glory of the Lord, right? So, at one point, if I read David, which is much later than this, they knew what the glory was. He's pointing that there's a king of glory that's coming to make his way up a mountain. Hmm. Did you know this happened in the New Testament? Yeah. Matthew 17. Let's look at it real quick. I'm sorry. I know. What, when am I done? Whenever you want to <laughs> Okay. I mean, if, if you want me to stop, you just say, hey, all right, thanks. I'm good. Um, I got to eat lunch. All right. Let's go to Matthew 17 real quick. I'll try not to keep you too much longer. Okay. We got lots of watch blockers. All right. That's good news. You watch this clock. We'll always be one of the hands. All right. Here it is. Matthew uh, 17. After six, G or six days, Jesus took him took with him Peter, James, and John. These are his closest disciples, the one who had spent uh, the most amount of time with him. You remember John? He wrote a gospel that we've been in all, all day, right? So we've, we've been reading about him. Peter, James, and John. By the way, the only gospel writer in this is John, right? I, I'm not setting his, his uh, gospel aside as though the other ones aren't any good. They are good. Um, but John had a different perspective, I think, because of this. Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Can you imagine? Peter like, what's going on? Hey, this is cool. I want to be here, right? And then in the middle of it, while he was still speaking, Peter, shh, hang on just a second. Just, I, I, I know you're excited. I know this is overwhelming. Peter, just, just hang on a minute, right? While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. Can you imagine? Moses, Elijah, Jesus, glory. <coughs> <coughs> terrified at hearing God's voice. What's Jesus say? Come on, get up. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Why? Because when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Amen. He was with them. Amen. He was with them. Anointed by God's Spirit. 
Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all there in the same place, on the mountain. The way you ascend the mountain of the Lord is to be with Jesus. That's it. You don't have to come to this building. Please do. Please do. The church has a, a really important role for equipping the saints. You have, you have a great church here. God is here. And I, I felt his presence on Monday. My first time here, I felt his presence. He was here. I feel his presence even now. I hope you can too. There's, um, there's something that, that stood out to me here. If we go back to, uh, to John, or excuse me, John 1. Verse 15. John testified about him, crying out, This is the one of whom I said, He who comes after me is greater than me, because he existed before me. The God of all glory, creator, creator of heaven and earth. Jesus in flesh, transfigured for the glory cloud, everything. Like, he's God. He's God. Listen to this next part. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Oh, praise God. What is that grace? It's two times he says it. Grace upon grace. Like there was there was grace, something given. And then there was another grace. Yeah. Right? What is it? What are these two graces? Well, the word became flesh. Jesus came in the flesh. And he lived a perfect sinless life. Tempted at all points and yet without sin. That's Hebrews. He walked, excuse me, he walked the path to the cross willingly. Only one time that scripture records did he ask for a different path. But then he said, not my will, Lord. Yours be done. Amen. Faithful all the way to the end, even hanging on the cross, looking down at his mother. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Amen. They don't know. That's the first grace. The first grace is justification. Jesus justified us. He atoned for our sins. He paid the price that was necessary for our sinfulness. Why? In order that we might be able to have relationship with him. In order that we would know him. The word became flesh. That was the first grace. Here's the second. And he made his home among us. Has he made his home in you? Have you opened the door? Have you given him access to every room? I'm not here to play. I want the real thing. I want the fullness of Christ. Amen. I'm not trying to be somebody. I don't care about a platform. I don't care about being anybody. Jesus was very clear. The race to the top is a race to the bottom. The first will be last and the last will be first. Amen. Have you given him access to your whole life? Or is there something that you might be holding back? Some of us might be waiting to see him in person. God, if you just show me, think of Thomas, if you just show me the marks in your hands, then I'll believe it's you. That's one thing. Jesus did, right? Thomas asked. Jesus showed him. And Thomas believed. But blessed are those who believe and have yet not seen him. What if we don't see him? What if there is no miracle that happens in our life that we can see and tell? There are miracles every day, but what if there is no miracle? Like, if the glory cloud doesn't descend upon this church, could we still follow? Yeah. Yeah. Intellectually, in our minds, sure. 
pretty hard to do sometimes, though. Yeah. And it's okay that it's hard. And it's okay. Because we have a helper. Yeah. We have a helper, an advocate. Amen. Did you know that scripture says that Jesus is interceding for us on our behalf mm -hmm. to the Father? God. Did you know that there's someone else who's also interceding for us? The Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Interceding for us with word or with groanings. Oh, I'm going to mess that up. But the point is that the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf when we can't even come up with the words like just now. Amen. Right? He's interceding for us. I want, to, um, I want to move to my notes here real quick because I think there's something really important that uh, I want to make sure I get it in sequence so that we, um, we can see it clearly. <clears throat> so we know that Jesus came into the world. He had that miraculous birth, right? Uh, and then he went into obscurity for 30 years. He came back, um, and at the age of 30, about, is when, when he started his public ministry. He started raising disciples. He called them two by two, which, by the way, I think is pretty cool because there has never been a moment in history when there has ever only been one Christian. You always had somebody else, right? You always had someone with you, a partner, to help you, aside from God himself. So all of that happens, and, and he raises up his disciples. Eventually, all, you know how the story goes. He ends up on the cross. He dies. A couple of days, the, the disciples are not sure what, what to do. Where do we go from here? So they just kind of they fade away, right? They just go. And then all of a sudden, word gets out. The tomb's empty. Amen. The stone's been rolled away. It's done. But not only that. How about the next 40 days? He appeared to us. Yeah. How, how, many or how many people saw him? 500. 500. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes we think it was only to the disciples, right, in the upper room. Or that it was, it was only, um, you know, to people here and there, right? The, the, the people on the, the way to Emmaus, right? No, no, no. Scripture says, I forget which gospel, um, but it says that he appeared to 500 people over the course of the next 40 days. Incredible. Still signs and wonders happening, by the way, right? That, I don't know if you realize this. There were like a bunch of dead people that got up, started walking around. Yeah. <laughs> Read the scripture. It's in there. I promise you. Can you imagine? Um, all of that happens. And you're like, yeah, man, Jesus is back. He's back. Cool, let's do this. We got dead people going. We got, you're showing yourself to everybody. Let's, let's go to Caiaphas' house. Come on, let's go see Caiaphas, right? The high priest, remember? The one who put him on the cross? That wasn't the plan. That wasn't the plan at all. Jesus said, I have to go away. I'm sorry, what? I have to go. It's better for me, or for you. You know what, let me, let me just go straight from the text here. Forgive me, I didn't pull, the, pull up the, um, I don't know which, which passage this is from, but it's in, the, it's in the scriptures. It might be Matthew. I think it's Matthew. I don't remember which chapter. It says, if you love me, keep my commands. This is Jesus speaking. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The word, excuse me, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. Knows him. The world might know about him, but they don't know him. But you know him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. In you. Amen. The image of God is in you. Christ came. He's in you. Now he's talking to the disciples here, right? People who have had an experience with the Lord. They know. He 
is in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Wait a minute. You can see without seeing? It's called faith. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father. We're united. John 17, if you want to read about that, John 17 is incredible. I am in my Father, and you are in me. And I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. What are you talking about? How, do you, how is it possible that, that Jesus is in the Father, and he's in me, and I'm in him? How, how can that even be possible? The key is love. The key is love. Loving the way Jesus loved. Loving the way Jesus loved. Can we do it? In our flesh, no. In our flesh, absolutely not. It's always going to be twisted. There's going to be some weird thing that comes out. It's not going to be love. John 16. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you about this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. I'm leaving. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. I know you don't want me to go, but I'm going. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go, the advocate, the helper, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if, you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So Jesus ascends to the Father. And the disciples wait. They wait. And all of a sudden, Peter stands up to preach. Acts 2. Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit comes, and 3,000 people are saved in that day. One message. It wasn't about the message at all. It was about the Spirit. The Spirit came. Can I tell you that if the Spirit's here with us today, and I believe He is, Amen. we can be saved. You'll be saved. Jesus has already done the work, but there's a second grace. There's a second grace. The fullness of God. A second work of grace where he would give you his Holy Spirit. To empower you. To walk out the life that he's called you to. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John 3, he said, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. He was afraid to come in public. So he came to him by night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you can do unless God is with him. And so Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless somebody is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Nicodemus is, is confused. He says, How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he go into his mother's womb a second time and be born? He's a, he thinks things literally, right? How am I going to do that? It doesn't work. <laughs> Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water, there's a baptism of repentance, that's John, and of what? The Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So let me ask you, did you receive the Holy Spirit? 
when you first believe. That's not every person speaking. And that's okay. You know, those aren't my words. Those are Paul's in Acts 19. I'm going to go there, and then we'll finish with this. Acts 19, verses 1 through 7. It says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Uh, you remember the book of Ephesians. That's, that's where the Ephesians were from. They were from Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, we haven't even heard there was one. What is this Holy Spirit? Paul says, well, what baptism did you get? Well, we had a baptism of repentance. It's the water, right? And Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. Jesus is coming again. He's coming for his church. He's already paid the ransom, but he's coming again to take us home. In the meantime, he wants us to work with him in what he's doing in the world. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Now, I don't know, I don't know what the Lord will do in our midst here today. I'm not saying that you're going to speak in tongues. Maybe, I don't know. Um, it's not about the gifts. It's not about anything that, that you might get. But I believe that the Lord wants to give you an encounter with the Holy Spirit today. Can I tell you, let me ask you something. Have I been true to the word today? Yeah. I've shown you everything that's come right out of this book. I, I don't, if it doesn't come from this book, I can't put my faith in it. Yeah. Right? Even if it sounds good. But everything I've shared with you came from this book. It's not just some impression. Two years ago and one day, I was in a rough place. I, um, I was, I, I uh, just to give you some background, I was working full-time, going to school full-time. Uh, at one point, I was in the Navy Reserve, so that's a part-time duty. Serving in the church, part-time. Uh, ran out of time. <laughs> ran out of time. Burned myself out. And I quit everything, except my job, because that provided for my family. By the way, I was a husband and a father of two girls. Shows you where my priorities were back then. And they're getting better. They're not perfect, but they're getting better. But I was in a rough spot, December 2018. And I spent some time listening to what the Lord would say. And all year he had been telling me out of Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all other things will be granted unto you. Amen. And then he paired that up with an Old Testament passage, Jeremiah 29, 13. Everyone knows Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and give you a hope in the future. But two verses later, he says, you will seek me and you will find me Amen. when you seek me with your whole heart. Amen. I had to lay it all before him. So I listened to a series of messages. It was about a week each night. Um, and on the, the drive to work a couple of days, I was listening to messages and just praying uh, all throughout. December 19th, um, I was in this room of our house, and, uh, and I'm, I'm praying. And, uh, and all of a sudden, can I tell you that it felt like the, the Lord walked into the room? He walked into the room. And... Um, I didn't see him. I, I was physically overwhelmed. I had no radar. I know, like this was not on my radar. I had no exposure to this. Like I, I didn't grow up 
charismatic, I didn't grow up Pentecostal, it wasn't my, my thing. I, I still am not. But I put my faith in the Lord, and I sought him, and he showed up. So what do you do with that? Right. What do you, yeah. You say, God, what's next? Okay, what do you want me to do? <laughs> right? Can, can I tell you what he told me? He gave me one word. One word. Not his audible voice, but I knew in my heart it was him speaking. He said, preach. He said, preach. Right? That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. It's because of what he did. And I believe that he gave me his, the fullness of his Holy Spirit. Am I perfect? Am I without sin? No. No, I'm far from it. But his spirit is working in me. He's helping me. He's helping me understand that even though I've spent all week, and you can ask my wife even until this morning, I didn't have a clear line of how this message was going to go. I knew where I was going to start, and I knew where he wanted me to end. And the middle was a blur. But I believe he's here today. Amen. And so I'd like, um, I don't know if it's the tradition in your church, but in talking with Michael, he's, he said that Moses would do this from time to time. So I just wanted to, uh, this is kind of like an altar, right? Mm -hmm. It's a stage, I guess, but it's, it's an altar. If you have anything that the Lord has just laid on your heart today, uh, maybe, maybe he's convicted you and shown you that something you're involved in is not what he wants you to do or be involved in. His grace is here. He's patient. He's willing to meet you there and to help you out of it. Maybe it's that you don't know where to go. Your pastor is leaving. Maybe you don't know how this is going to go. Maybe it's difficult. You don't know how the pandemic is going to affect things. Can I tell you that God is here? He wants to meet you. Amen. Finally, maybe you feel like you've been doing everything you can in your power to follow him. And all you see is failure, or maybe you're stuck or confused. Maybe you need a special touch from the Lord. Maybe you need him to show you that he's in you. You've heard it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've heard it. But maybe you want him to come and make himself known to you today. Now, I don't know how he'll choose to come. Would you come? Would you come? The altars are open. This space is for you. The Lord is with you. Praise God. Praise God. There's a, there's a passage in James. done this before, but when Moses was at the burning bush, he took off his shoes because it was holy ground. This is a holy space. God, you were with us. You've done everything necessary. Thank you for each person that you're drawing into you now, Lord. And I thank you for these who have come. God, who present their needs before you. 
asking God that you would fill them. God, would you do your work? We can't do this without you. We need the fullness of relationship with you. God, where we have not been with you, we need you to take us into the closet. We need to hear your voice calling us. God, but I sense that there are some in this room who are ready to take that next step. That they're the ones who've been saying, Lord, I've been calling your name. I've been waiting for you to do your work. God, that you would be here with me. God, that you would help me to do what it is that you have called me to do. Equip your people, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, God. That there would be miracles, signs, and wonders accomplished amongst them. Lord, that, that the glory that would be had would be pointed to you. Men and women can't do these things. But you can bring healing and wholeness to each soul. Move in this place, Lord. We thank you. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. There's a, there's a passage in James. It says, are any of you sick? Do any of you need healing? Let them come forward and be anointed by the elders of the church. So I just want to give one more invitation. If there's anything that you need, touch from the Lord, would you come? If you want to be anointed, I've got the oil. I'm not an elder in this church, but I'm called by God himself to minister freedom and wholeness. any other elder in this church, I would encourage you to come. I'm going to come around. Let's just sit with the Lord for a minute. I'm going to come around to each person. And uh, in light of COVID, I'm, I'm not going to come in front of you, but if, if you're okay with that, I'm going to come and put my hand on your back. I'll stand behind you. Just ask that the Lord would bless you. If you want to be anointed, just let me know as I come.
there's nothing about the natural that makes sense about this, Lord. But Lord, we believe that when we ask you to come, you said, ask and we will receive. That uh, we should seek and you will find and knock and the door will be opened for us. God, we ask all of this in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would touch Carl now. That even right now, Lord, that you would sense your healing touch. God, baffle the doctors. Baffle the doctors, Lord. May this be the moment where the anointing of Christ came. I just wanted to share with you that the Lord is still with us. He's there with you. And so, uh, Michael, if we could just keep this going for a little while, uh, you're dismissed. But if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay. Stay here as long as you like. There's nothing about what I have said makes me any special person other than I was the one that the Lord chose today to bring you this message and his love. Go now in his love when you're ready. Change the world. Start a love revolution. church. We're going to keep playing this music, but uh, we're going to move into our offering. And uh, if you're new here, well, before I do this, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if you're new here, when we come together for offering, we like to get low before the Lord, humbly asking him, how do we give? What should we give? How does generosity, how should it reflect in each one of us individually? So please, church, let's bow our heads, close our eyes, let's talk to our Lord and ask our Father, how should we be obedient? Heavenly Father, we Thank you, Lord. I thank you. I can't. I can't thank you enough. As cliche as it might sound, Heavenly Father, you know my heart. 